the pale blue dot. Over here. Yes. Where in the world are you? Mate, I'm in France at the moment. It's bloody, bloody cold. It's beautiful though. It's the first time I've ever been here. What, do you, what takes you there? Well, we, um, we, we stopped working in Bali um, and we just kind of wanted it. We were moving into a bit of a career change and we wanted to, um, well, we, we wanted to try to find a place essentially that um, could deal with the uh, financial capabilities at the time. So we, um, we found uh, Trusted House Sitters, which is a really cool website and you basically can jump around and, and house sit for people. It's pretty self-explanatory. And um, we found this beautiful place in, in, in France and um, Siobhan can, can ride horses and I can speak French. So it was just like a really cool way. It's like a farm out here. So it worked well and we're just sitting here and get to write and uh, get to uh, speak some Francais and eat some baguettes. No, no part, no pun intended. Très bien. Yes, very, very bien. Très bien. Yep. In fact, a whole lot of bien's. A whole lot of bien. Yeah. I was out riding with my mate Luke Heggy this morning, who's a a stand-up, and um, I've known him since I was eight. I'm very grateful for that. Um, But he, his wife is French, and he speaks fluent French. He's a stand-up comic, and um, you know, his kind of persona on stage is uh, he does a lot of construction work. Yeah. So. His persona on stage is kind of like a, a very well-read tradesman. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he, he you know, puts a bit of mayo on it, speaks with a bit of a drawl. Yeah, he's, which is what you he's need. He's very clever man. He's got, he's got two master's degrees. He's a very, very clever man. Yeah, and I was with him in Paris once, and I uh, was like, yeah, mate, check that out. La, 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 la. And then someone says, uh, oh, I mean, monsieur. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And he just went, boo, and he went straight into... Um, uh, you know, French and didn't miss a beat and giving directions, no Google Maps go like, and if anyone's ever been to Paris, it's a freaking rabbit warren. Yes. Yeah. Was, you know, they're a product of the enlightenment, but they were not enlightened about their street design. And it's, it's like, I am second on the left and then you go past the statue of the pigeon and then blah, 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 blah. stop hearing like blah, 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 car, blah, 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 hotel, blah, 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 blah statue. You go up to like a few words here and there. I'm just listening to it. I uh, describe it. I wish I were bilingual. I'm only monolingual. Yeah, um, yeah. That's it. I could say um, yes, no, please, and thank you, and I'm vegan in a few different languages, but that's about it. Yeah, okay, yeah. What about Hebrew? Can you can and you speak? Toilet. Oh yeah, well that's the most important one. Yeah. I just can't say that in English. <laughs> oh yes. Do you know that was that's really interesting? I, I went to um, Mexico and that was the only thing I learnt in in in. I used to say Mexican. That was terrible. I mean, in Spanish as well. I just be it's uh well it was what you just said. But I remember the banos part and um, yeah. geez, that got me out of a lot of issues. <laughs> yeah, Montezuma's revenge. Yeah, it was uh, good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so how's how's the podcast going? Good, mate. It's going it's going really well. Um, it's uh. It's obviously just um, a slow plug, but obviously, like yourself, it's it's great just to um, it's just really fun to get to speak to people, you know, and um, yeah, just to open up about it. And um, my my podcast is not, I mean, necessarily it's got kind of like a a three thing about the mental health side and spirituality and and the and the authenticity approach. But um, I guess kind of every podcast is about that, really, just getting to know someone and and having a chat and. And um, I don't have any sort of frame of reference because I've not done a whole lot of TV. I've been on Neighbours a few times. I was in Miss Fisher Murders, actually. And uh, I was on Glitch as well. Uh, deliberately? Were you deliberately in Neighbours? <laughs> well, I was on... I mean, I was. I was extra. I was an extra. But I mean, I, I, went, for the, I went for the food. Let's be honest. <laughs> this is an authentic podcast. <laughs> Mate, let's, let's be honest. Uh, craft services, when it comes to drama production, is no joke. <sighs> it is no joke. My God. Uh, re- not the same with reality. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, when it comes to drama production, if they don't have the food on point, uh, yeah, man, it's, it's good. It's, it's good. unbelievable. We were on holidays in um, we were on holidays in Hawaii a couple of weeks back, and um, my kid is obsessed with Hawaii Five O, <laughs> and we um, through mates of a mate and a friend of a friend and an email here and a few texts there and some hustle and some luck. We managed to get on set and have a oh. visit. And yes, 
there's coffee carts and there's that water and there's room temperature or there's ice water or there's Evian <laughs> or there's Beijing water or, you know, what is your, your celiac? We heard your celiac. Can we make you something? Yeah. Uh, no, I'm good. No, I'll just take <laughs> coffee and we'll just watch. Thank yeah, you. that's right. Yeah. It's extraordinary. <laughs> we'll have some of that 90 degree room temperature water, please, if that's all right. <laughs> Oh, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I know. Out of here. Yeah. This is, pfft, you'd never get this in Australia. <laughs> nah, no. I got, um, you were saying before about the scooter in Bali. This is like on the, oh God, this would have been like the third last day. We were driving, as you do, driving illegally. I can say this, it's an authentic podcast. I made that joke twice, but we'll, we'll keep it in there. And um, obviously, so I just I just took a wrong turn. It, it was literally right, and then after three seconds, having realised that I'd gone down a wrong way, turned right back in, but got pulled over by a cop, and obviously I didn't have the um, licence, so just sneaky little thing here and there, and moved on. But it's it's a weird system over there, you know? It's weird. It makes you... It's weird. It's It kind of makes you appreciate a little bit more of the... Uh, the laws we have in place you know there are some some parts of bali where it's just, this is just incredible it's just like a, it's just like a party scene and i can do whatever i want and then there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that and um specific things you know i'm, I'm happy that we have uh we have laws here for them you know <laughs> i um i was quite affected by that trip to bali all with right Audrey, um in in a number of ways but particularly around that um, there's a bar in Changu, which you'll know the name mm. of, uh, it's called Pretty Poison. Oh yeah. And, um, it's at the other end of a death trap of a road, which is utterly terrifying <laughs> to, to ride your scooter down. But you can go into a bar and watch old school skate videos projected onto the wall behind you. Um, while in front of you there's an actual skate bowl in the backyard with people ringed right around it. People will session and skateboards will fly out at your head, no problem. And you could get a tattoo in the corner uh, <laughs> of this bar if you wanted. And what I love about that is that, as you mentioned, it's personal responsibility. It's mm. like, oh, you went out last night, you got wasted, and you got a matching tattoo with someone that you know for 15 minutes and then copped the skate deck to the face? <laughs> okay. Great. Did you walk in there? Yeah. Did you the... see all that stuff on the way in? Who's that on? I know. And it just made me think about, with a bit of sadness, Tom, it made me think about, in Australia at least, we have so many laws in place. Um, the choice to take a risk is taken away from us mm. and what are we losing what are we losing as a culture when it comes to ideas business ideas uh, uh ideas within our community because we've never learned to take a risk we've mm. never learned we've never oh okay can't do that but there's a great reward if the risk you know is is, is worth it and mm. it don't make did make me a little bit of a bummer i was mm. like what have we missed out on by breeding an entire nation of people that have never had responsibility true personal responsibility you know on their shoulders mm. um uh, you know what are we missing out on as a culture uh, as far as ideas go around what might be in the end really good ideas for our, our society so anyway, true then i got back on my stupid scooter and rode back up <laughs> then you got a tattoo what they call a, what they call a yellow brick road which is a Probably the most terrifying thing I've ever ridden or driven on in my life. Was that the was that the um there was that concrete skate park you were talking about? Uh that was in the back of the pub, back of the bar. Yes. Right. And then there was this there was this road, this shortcut between Shortcut, Chengu yeah. And, <laughs> and not Seminyak. Um no, well like one side of Changu yep. and the other. Yep. There's a shortcut between there that was originally only supposed to be for scooters and bicycles, but it ended up the locals just pulled the bollards out and now cars just bang up and down it. Yeah. Um, it was so sketchy that on the last time we drove it, we went, fuck it, we'll take, we took us, we took 25 minutes to drive around rather than eight, because we were eight, staying 800 meters away. Oh. We took the, we took the 25 minute ride because it was, you know, less frightening. Yeah. <laughs> run the gauntlet of doing that. Oh, man. It was basically like, I don't know. Rice Paddy Road. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've done it heaps, but, you know, it was like trying to run, ride a skateboard down the middle 
of um, Gibney Road if there was no median strip in peak hour traffic and f- cars flying each direction of you at 80 kilometres an hour with the drop five feet to one side into a rice paddy. Oh, man. It's just crazy. It I is. I can't believe that I have managed to drive that as many times as I have with as many drinks as I have a few times um, without just falling. Like, it's, it's, it's meant, you're meant to fall. You're not meant to get over to the other side successfully. Uh, well, we did. Yeah. Uh, and I had one around. Luckily, I've ridden, I've done a lot of bicycle riding. So oh, I've right. done enough of just like, look where you want to go. Just look where you want to go and you'll go there. Yeah. And so I, I knew enough of that. Don't, if you look at the car, you'll go into the car. Just look at the six inches between the wing mirror of the truck coming at you <laughs> and the precipice into the rice paddy and you'll be fine. <laughs> and we were. So... Oh, yeah, no, it's crazy. I think you, you do it once and then you're like, right, that was a thrill and I'm happy I did that. I don't probably need to do that again. But you're right, it catches you because it's like it's maybe two, three, four minutes to the other side or so you can risk your life or you can go half an hour around the other way. So it's like I'm struggling away at least half here. <laughs> In the end, I chose the half hour. Good, good. You've done well, you've done well, yeah. No, you're right though. In terms of what you were talking about, with the responsibility, I actually um, ended up getting a drunk tattoo just on the on the forearm here, and uh, I'm very proud of it because it was one that uh, Siobhan and I had wanted to do for a while. But it's crazy what you can get away with there. They, it was it was honestly, man, it was like twenty bucks, and they were feeding us shots of whiskey, five, six, seven. You, when you're in that mindset, and you could put any music on as well, you can just. I'm only talking about tattoos. I've, I've got a few, so I'm very well inclined to to think like this but you you just set up to everything's just this big buzz of dopamine and you're just kind of like oh god what can i do here things are dirt cheap i can get away with murder you know the, the dot that you know the cops don't care it can get pretty crazy well yeah the, the flip side of all that is that well any any community where law enforcement can be bought is uh yeah there's a level of still sort of dodginess <laughs> dodginess around there things can get loose it's true um, as long as you stay on the right side of that you're okay but if you stay get on the wrong side of that you are toast mm, absolutely you're, you're absolutely toast um and yeah you know I, I when i lived at south bondi uh with my family there was a this real horrible thing happened there was a, an american kid out here he was a good looking fellow like a lacrosse player or something was quite fit mm. and quite a real on him and he decided to go swimming in this massive swell i don't know why but he jumped off rocks into this huge swell i think he, they saw him dive under one wave and then he was okay and then he vanished but oh. for three straight days uh the, the westpac rescue helicopter hovered in front of our house for about 45 minutes to an hour at a time three times a day searching for his body for three straight days. It's crazy. And well, part of me is like, I'm pretty grateful that we live in a country where they will spend, helicopters aren't cheap. Yeah. Um, but True. they'll spend that much money and that much time and allocating a resource to a person who came to our country, not even a, a native of our country, uh, to search for him. Um, I don't know if they ever found him, but in Indonesia and Bali and be like bad luck yeah that's right so you know and if I have had the misfortune to have had to spend a night in um, or at least some time in the emergency room mm. at the hospital there in Denpasar oh yeah. and you don't want you don't want to have that kind of desperation because there's there really is very very little primary care as far as healthcare goes. So I guess it's a balance, you know. Mm. Do you want to be able to get? Do you want to get away with you know having your own self will run your life? Uh, do you want to accept a bunch of rules and regulations but know that if your house is on fire, you can dial three numbers into a telephone that is connected to uh, you know another house, and someone will drive a five million dollar piece of firefighting equipment over with twelve highly trained people to <laughs> get that fire out and save your yeah. family. <laughs> Sometimes. It's true. And you know what? I think this is the beautiful thing about travel is that you you have a change in perspective and you can reflect. And ref- you can only grow through reflection, really. And you, you get to reflect and you get to look at all the things in your life back home, physically, really, as well as psychologically. And you can see, 
okay, this is the thing I really love, and for you and I, this is the thing I really love about Australia. These are things that I would change about myself, and I'm the exact same as you. <clears throat> I mean, Australia, we're just so blessed, so blessed, you know, to, to have grown up in that way. What I would change is probably the responsibility to take on myself to take more responsibility, you know? But it's, 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 that's all they have in, in Bali, and the opportunity to, to, to really get out of that area. I met a, I met a, a little, a little lady who was, um, who did our laundry. She was lovely. She was very little, very, she wouldn't have been more than five foot. And, um, you know, just, just paying her the amount that we did that she would ask for, it was $2 Australian for a huge heap of laundry. And you, you think about how much the business has to make for that to be, you know, making some sort of money for it and then how much then she would get paid for it. She'll never see, at least as far as I can tell, outside of that little area of, of, of Bali, of, of Changu, it's on the border of Seminyak. And yet she was the happiest thing in the world. And it, it really confused me for a long time, but her responsibility was in doing the best job she could at that, at that laundromat. It was amazing. Yeah, I, I had a, it is, you know, we sound like a couple of privileged white guys. <laughs> oh, you know, mate, have a $10 I, note. <laughs> I, you know, I've started, I'm, you know, I, I, I question, I, obviously I'm, you know, it's got someone who got brought up with materialism as, as, you know, the religion and the doctrine, that's, mm. that's where we are as a society in, in uh, modern westernized culture. And uh, when I lived in America, that was definitely, definitely the case. Mm. And, um, you know, I think sometimes, do, what, does it bring me happiness? The answer is no. Mm. Um, do I want to, you know, purchase things that bring me happiness? I don't know. What brings me happiness? I guess things that bring me utility yeah. bring me happiness. That's kind of it. Uh, as far as, you know, I'm not, I'm not hanging out to buy a certain kind of watch. I'm mm. not hanging out to buy a particular kind of sunglasses. Um, I used to be, mm. but I'm not, I'm not anymore. And uh, I don't know if we as a culture have got it 100% right as far as the whole buying things will make it better promise, which, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to pan around the room here, but <laughs> and just to the left of me is this massive pile because uh, I'm mid Marie Kondo of my, um, my office. I'm, I'm mid, I'm looking for things that spark joy. And, oh, yeah. uh, let me tell you, you know, there's a bunch of shit that I didn't need to buy. Um, that has, uh, followed me around from house to house and you know I think about well, those raw materials uh, you know the, the the energy that went into producing those things really, <laughs> oh I know what are they going to do now are they going to be landfill I don't know it's um yeah I don't know if we've got it right you know people like uh, we're caught I think in our culture uh, you know to somewhere between wanting what your lady that did your laundry has mm. and you know trying to get it by buying shit totally well and i don't know i don't know if we've got it right i i, I think i went i went down this road um really quite aggressively um in moving to bali because i'd i'd lost um my identity and i'd lost i'd struggled with um mental health and can't wait to get into it obviously um before that and then i came out of that and um, was like, right, I really want to help everyone and I want to, you know, rid the world of anxiety and I want to change the global perspective. And then I moved away from competitive sport with CrossFit and football for me and then um, wanting to do that stuff, which is what was the mind made essentially. It wasn't just the podcast. And I moved away from Bali and again, through reflection, I was, I was looking back and I was like, wow, I, I was the same person. I thought I'd changed, you know, but I was, I was only going to be happy when, you know, for AFL or only going to be happy when, you know, ridden the world of anxiety. I moved away from that and I was like, you know, you don't have to do anything. And what came of it was a bit of an existential crisis, you know, because it was, I, I essentially came to see that I was identifying myself through the external world. And I, I didn't know, um, not that I essentially believe that you always have an identity, everything changes in this universe, 
but um, I'd moved away from that and had to really go inward because there was a lot of still, there's lots of stuff that was still bubbling below the surface. You know, my OCD wasn't entirely perfect then. My, I still was having a panic attack every now and then, although I was just more comfortable talking about it, you know. Um, but you're exactly right, man. It's, um, it's, it's how you feel on the inside when, when no one's there. I mean, can you sit, can you sit in a room just by yourself and, and be happy, you know? Or do you, do you need things outside of yourself to, to, deva- to validate those holes? Yeah, and at the end of the day, you can't, you can't take any of it with you, man. None, mm. none of us is going to get out of this alive, and you can't take any of that stuff with you. So, um, yeah, finding, uh, finding the – I don't know if happiness – I was talking to someone about this the other day. There's happiness and there's, you know, contentment. Mm. Um, happiness, happiness can be, you know, fleeting, but ha- – you know, lasting happiness. I, I, I think what's more sustainable for for me, I think, is is contentment and finding. And I'm I'm quite content with this. Mm. Like trying to hold that peak of I'm so happy. Trying to hold that peak is quite difficult. Um, just trying to be content with your day and what you've got, and you know that that might be a more of a more of something to aim for and, mm. um you know the path the path of that is you know i guess you know an effective path of that is, is in helping others and that's mm. that's pretty much that's pretty much uh, pretty much it it's buying stuff doesn't really last very long mm. and you so like, I'm, i imagine you'd learn i've never struggled with addiction before but i'm sure you would have learned that um that idea about contentment because you know that that moving to and yours was out with with alcohol from from what I understand, but um, stealing the happiness of tomorrow was a good friend of mine used to say and being on such a high, or more or less it was depressant, but then feeling that extreme low at the same time. If you find that contentment, you find essentially what the Taoists were talking about, really, isn't it? With the with the with that balance motive. Uh yeah yeah um, the al- alcohol was a. Uh... You know, I, I'm not a special snowflake, unfortunately. I, I dealt with my anxiety in the same way that many men deal with their anxiety in my country um, through alcohol. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, for a while it worked. And after a while, though, the amount that I needed to feel anywhere near normal or accepted or okay, it just became unsustainable. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, I, I, the way I describe it is that I, um, I guess a way, to, a way to describe it that would, if someone, no one's ever had a problem with addiction, um, is that I, in the same way that some people have an allergy to peanuts, I think even the tiniest bit can stop them breathing. Um, I have an allergy to alcohol and that the tiniest bit changes my brain and changes my decision making process mm. and I'm no longer in charge of um my choices mm. and I, I, it triggers a i have an allergic reaction i guess that's the best way to describe it i i i, I start to change my personality starts to change and um things that i would otherwise not be into or want <clears> to <throat> do suddenly become great great ideas and mm. <laughs> that good point started to become quite a problem yeah, um, yeah. That's that's been quite a problem. Yeah. So it's you know, like if you've got a peanut allergy, you just avoid peanuts. Uh, yeah. I avoid alcohol. Yeah. Do you know what's interesting about it though? <clears throat> is like you, I guess you've seen the extremes of what an addiction um, can can lead to. You know, but I think I mean alluding to what we we're talking about before with with having to buy something or that material world. I think a lot of us may not know the lesser degree of the way addiction plays on our on our on our minds and the way we we do things you know um there I, w- I was reading so much about this with with the um neurochemistry behind addiction and, and the differences between dopamine and serotonin <clears throat> excuse me and even just that little feeling of excitement you know it's just like a little kind of thing like oh and it, it changes your decision making a little bit and i reckon that a lot of us would find that on the very, very, very lower levels, deeper levels of our psyche, there are things that we hold on to that are 
not entirely within our own minds. And you don't necessarily have to call that an addiction because, you know, it's not like it's ruining your life or it's, or it's really causing some sort of negative impact. But um, we can be wired like that. And it's, I think it's really important to be aware of those things. Yeah, that's that <clears throat> part of being, I guess, mindful <clears throat> and, and learning to uh, question automatic thoughts mm. and automatic beliefs. That's a, that's a big part of uh, what I've, you know, what I've found, um, you know, certainly when it comes to getting triggered or something like that. Um, not triggered like the internet talks about triggered. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, you can't fucking, can't handle someone challenging this political <laughs> Dude, I, know, I am offended right now. <laughs> that's that's not it. Yeah. Um, that's a what? That's a what right now? I am offended. <laughs> I'm so offended. How dare you offend Just me? Just kill me. I'm gonna finish this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, no. Uh, trigger like a trauma trigger. Totally. Um, so when that shows up, and my body remembers, you know, and my body then reacts knowing that oh this is just a feeling in my body it's not actually real mm. even though the first time you felt it it was an actual reaction to an actual thing feeling it now you're like oh it's just my body it's just a bunch of nerves sending you know information to a muscle in my stomach to tense up that's all it is yeah. it's not it's not evidence that what i'm thinking in my head is actually happening it's not and learning to question those thoughts is important mm. and uh it helps you identify the ones that are perhaps distorted or false and helps you replace them with more rational versions of, of, of what it is you're, you're perceiving. Um, and that just comes from being mindful. That just comes from looking for the space between the breaths and checking your own body and seeing what's going on here. What's that react? Is that a signal? Is that a signal that something's not right? Mm. Oh, it might be. What's up? Oh, that thing. Oh, that's right. Ah. Oh. <laughs> The person that I'm having a meeting with is wearing the same per- same perfume as the sex yeah. that I used to have. As I am. Ah, <laughs> ah, that's what it is. Yes. Right, of course. Of course I feel tense and weird. Mm. My body's remembering that shit. So being aware of that stuff is important. Definitely. And how much do you think... I heard you speak about the, the idea that um, um, a lot of the, I guess, prerequisites for... Um, an anxiety, not necessarily the disorder, but that that higher degree of anxiety came from with what your parents had to go through. Did you go back when you when you and this is this comes from obviously a, a massive degree of responsibility and actually taking the bottle away and being like, right, I have to deal with what's going on that I'm trying to escape from here. When you start to go into the anxiety disorder, how much of it was predicated upon um, you know what your parents had to deal with? I think from what, as far as I can tell and as far as the research that I've read, um, some of it's genetic right? and some of it's, you know, some of it's what you got born with. Some of it's, you know, the, the wiring you got and some of it is your environment mm. where you're living. Um, for some people, those ratios are 50, 50, for some people, those ratios are 90, 20, uh, 90, 10. Yeah. Um, so I think I think up to as far as I'm aware, I think like up to half can be, you know, how you get born. Mm. Um, you know, I, I know I was always a junkie kid. This was. Mm. Um, but it's then what gets done with that. You know, you can be a junkie kid and have a very super stable life and never have any trauma and learn how to control your your nervous system responses and you know have some emotional regulation skills up your sleeve and then you have a pretty great time. Uh, or if you do it, if you're me, you, uh, <laughs> you just kind of run with that stuff and, uh, you know, jump in spiders and, um, get into a heightened, more and more heightened levels of, of anxiety over not much. Mm. And, um, yeah. And then search for ways to try and calm that, uh, which is what I was doing. So yeah, life is very different now, but, um, I would say that, you know, you're particularly referring to both my parents at one point were, were refugees and there mm. was some definite trauma around that about displacement and things like that. My mum, mm. when she was quite young, and my dad um, in his mid, early 20s. And um, I've learned that if you have a, and this is scientifically proven, though, it's called to me by a psychologist who's very, very well versed in this, 
that if there is if you have untreated trauma um that can affect your affect you on a dna level and you can you can pass that on to your kids mm. um so it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out um because you know you want your everybody wants their kids to be happy and healthy and they'll probably look half like you but but you know the genetic similarities don't end there you know the way you're wired is passed on as mm. far as i can tell it's you know at least half anyway and so get your trauma sorted out get it done because it causes changes in your dna that you'll pass on so yeah. not for you for many kids you plan on having so true it's so true and there's so much wisdom to be gained about yourself um by going inward you know do you have a practice for that that allows you just to maintain that connection between mind and body and, and who you are on the inside I, I try to i try to i try to get a meditation in every day and i and i try to do a bit of reflection afterwards um it's either in meditation or journaling mm. that i um just write stuff down and, and it, that's usually the easiest way to get to what's actually going on and um, uh, why do I feel like that? Why am I cranky when this sort of thing comes up? Why is it that I always have a hard time? And I guess the other part of that is is listening to people that know me better than myself, so mm. namely my wife. Yes. And, um, like my wife noticed a certain pattern of behavior that I have, which uh, um, I found really interesting, actually. she's um, She said, like, if you're in control, if you're the one that initiates the contact with the person you've not met yet, you have a, you're absolutely comfortable and calm about having a conversation. Um, however, if you're just standing there and someone comes up to you, if you're not the one in control, if you don't initiate it, she said you shrink away like a, you know, like a turtle into a shell. Really? Said, Damn, you're right. Yeah, if I'm not the one that initiates the conversation, uh, you know, it's not okay with me. So, How was it when um, I came up to you? <laughs> was it alright? I beg your pardon. How was it when I approached you on in in Bali? <laughs> Um, uh, it was actually okay. Okay. You had a different energy. Okay, good, good. Because you were mid-workout or something. You were, um, <laughs> you had a gym upstairs, I think, and you had a different energy about you. So, and plus I was with Audrey. Which True. Also helped. Good point. Um, and I think she just spent two days telling me, just for fuck's sake, just people are excited to see you. Say hello to them. Yeah, so, right. Yeah, and so I think that day I've been like, hi, people <laughs> who had, you know, recognized me. I'm lucky that I have a job where people recognize me and I get to meet people from all different walks of life and all mm. parts of the world that I would never, you know, otherwise meet. Um, and so I think it was the end of one of those days where I've been, you know, trying to work on that as a, oh, hello, nice to see you. You know, what are you doing here? Oh, that's fascinating. You know, trying to, trying to pretend that I was the one in control of the situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it, the uh, full disclosure was that um, my mate who was running, he came back up um, into the gym and he said, oh, Osha's downstairs. And I was like, fuck. And I literally said, fuck, I love that dude. And I just walked downstairs and um, I saw you, but you were mid-conversation with Audrey. So <laughs> I did the classic, like when Abe Simpson walks into that um, brothel and then he just quickly walks back out again. So I just walked straight past and I was like, oh, I missed my shot there. I'll pretend like I'm looking over at the sun or something and then... When I was, when I turned around, I'd be like, "Oh, gosh, there he is!" And I just not uh, just nonchalant killed it. <laughs> oh, it's a classic. It's a classic move. The Simpsons are very good at that. Oh. Most people haven't seen it. Basically, Bart is running a brothel. Yeah. And um, and he walks in, puts his hat on the hat stand like he's done for the last fifty years. Sees Bart, turns straight around, takes his hat off the hat stand, does a face and walks straight back out the door. And I think uh, you'll probably only find it in a gift, but. If you actually see it, he, he actually goes, hello, yeah. goodbye, he gives him one of those. <laughs> I know. Oh, man. I, I, I wanted to do a Simpsons podcast where, like, for some way, the guest on the show could just respond to me in Simpsons quotes. It would be unbelievable. <laughs> uh, oh, man, I've missed about eight years of it. I know. But it was the golden era when, I mean, I, I'm, I'm 25, but I was watching... Um, from you know, from the early '90s up to the to the late '90s, that was the era that I'm talking about. Well, it's golden era for you, but yeah, for True. some people who are you know who are 20 now, they'll call the last 10 years their golden era. So whatever era is the one that you're got your full attention for. That's the 
like that's the best music that ever lived. It's True. the music that was a soundtrack to the formative moments of your life. Of course, people think, oh, no, no, man. <laughs> Mid-2000s emo, that's yeah. music. <laughs> um, and that's wild, you know, because in probably 10 years from now, like WSFM or your local gold radio station, <sighs> 92 Gold or whatever it is near you, um, we'll be playing Panic at the Disco. Yeah. You know? And we'll be playing Dashboard Confessional. Right now, they're playing uh, John Farnham and uh, Ario Speedwagon. Yeah. I mean, in 15 years, they'll be playing Dashboard Confessional. And people will be like, that's right, yeah. Dad, I remember yeah. this. <laughs> whatever whatever music was the music that was playing when you were going through those formative years of you know, like those kind of breakthrough events, first party, first kiss, first sex, first drive, first holiday without your parents, those are the songs that... You know, when they come on the radio when you're 40, you go, fuck yeah, now this is music. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's just a trigger to a great memory, but that's what it is. It's so true. It is so true. And, um, well, yeah, no, you're exactly right. It just triggers that emotional response. And you're like, oh, God. Sometimes, um, I remember my cousin was telling me once that um, he, what's that song by the presets? Oh, oh, do, 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 do. Oh, was it My People? My People. And he said to me, bizarre i think he said it was like 17 or something but he was like oh turn that down when he came on the radio and i was like oh why and he's like oh mate it's a weird one but um whenever i hear this song i was um you know i was spending some time with myself so to speak just in uh, just in my room and um it came on my dad was playing it on the radio and it came on and um he started calling out to me and it just kind of ruined the whole moment <laughs> i was like right now now when i think of it i think of him bloody having a crack <laughs> I know, yeah. it wasn't good. <laughs> so now I hope that you start thinking about that too. <laughs> Tom's got a cousin that... <laughs> well, that, 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 that's the thing, man. Is like I'd gotten out of music television and pretty much left the country by the time the presets started having massive hits. So True. I, I wouldn't recognize the song if it came on the radio. Oh, it's good. It's heavy for me, for someone who was so, you know, deep into music for so long. For so long. Mm. Um, yeah, very good. It's 15 years or more. That was just all that I did. All that I did. Mm. Um, yeah. So what was it like when, uh, when you got the role for, uh, for Australian Idol to be the host? I mean, I grew up with it. You know, season one was massive. Wow. And um, I don't know. For, for me, it sounds incredibly... Brave is a subjective thing, you know, and staring down the camera speaking to that many people um, live, you know, it's um, it sounds very daunting. Like, what, just run us through that. Well, the the thing about... So you're talking about a show called Australian Idol, which is like American Idol. Yeah. When you buy... Uh, when a TV network buys a format, they're essentially buying a franchise. Like, say, for example, if right now in provincial France where you are, mm -hmm. you decided to put a McDonald's in there, buy a McDonald's, um, why would you do that? Because you know it's a business that works. You know there's great support from the people that designed it. You've got proven figures and numbers and a proven supply chain. Um, they'll send you, when you buy it, they'll send you the recipes, they'll send you the logos, they'll send you the operation manual, they'll send you exactly how to run it. All you have to do is follow the footsteps and boom, that's yeah. your business, okay? So similarly, when you buy a format, you, you're buying a franchise, all right? So they give you the logos, they give you the music, they give you the format. It all comes in this massive, big, thick ring binder called the Bible, um, which True. tells you, you know, here's what episode one looks like. Or like, say, for example, we were going to make, um, you know, the, the first time they made Love Island in Australia or the first time they made Married at First Sight in Australia. There's a Bible that comes with that. And it says, so when you're casting, you need, you know, we've, you know, it's worked in most some countries choose 15 some countries choose 22 we found the best number is 18 people right and the best amount you know so there's no boys no girls uh, we find it best if there's this many baddies this many goodies and this many you know whatever and wow. so all that stuff is in this bible so wow. anyway, the australian idol uh show was based upon the british format called pop idol and the original format had two hosts ant and deck who are superstars of uh, hosting and television in America, in uh, the UK. They were originally actors on a soap opera called Bike and Grove and then they worked together and um, they're, they're lovely, lovely, lovely guys. And um, 
so they were look the original version of American Idol had two hosts because that's what they bought. They mm. wanted to replicate because you basically want to go, okay, this worked in that market, let's just do it exactly the same because that's what worked. And you know, quickly his name was Brian Dunkelman. Um Good name. Dunkelman didn't make season two, Seacrest <laughs> took it out. Um, but with our season, they were looking for, you know, a two header mm. and they James Matheson and I were working on a music television format called Channel V, which is a cable TV channel. And we were working on Channel V at the time. And so we, you know, we were two guys that were used to live TV. And um, at the time, Channel V was just, we were flying around the world doing reports from backstage at the biggest festivals on the planet with all access all areas passes around our necks. Yeah. Know? And I was, I don't know, I was 28. Mm. And Jimmy was 25, 24. It was just extraordinary, right? And so then we, we got approached to do this <clears> gig and we had known like how massive a success Idol had been both in the UK and America. So of course we knew it's going to be a big show. 100%. And um, what was interesting is that we had, for the last few years at Channel V, been doing, all we did was live TV. Mm. And we were, because we were cable, we were kind of looked down upon from the in tenured TV people at the time because right. you know we were playing in our little cable box playground but it's not real television right but you know we were making 20 or 3 8 3 5 we were making 15 hours of live TV a week Jeez. you know we, you don't get to do you know one live cross a year if you're lucky if yeah. you're on TV we were doing 15 <clears throat> hours of it every week we were, all we did was live that's crazy so it was, I remember one of the producers came and said, so we're going to go live, okay? So that means if you get it wrong, you, you can't do it again, okay? <laughs> you, like, yeah, we've just come off tour with Channel V doing a show every afternoon for two hours on yeah. a satellite dish in front of 800 to 2,000 people every day. <laughs> we'll be all right, mate. Yeah. Um, I had a fair amount of arrogance at the time um, around that, and I, you know, I remember kind of in no uncertain terms going, do you have any idea what we've done for the yeah. last five years? Um, but they had it. They had it. They were busy making their shows, their 60 minutes shows and the you know, network television shows. They didn't know what we were doing. Um, needless to say that when we went live, everyone was very happy because we could do it. True. Because you know, we'd had a shitload of practice. And um, look, what can I say, man? I think the research eventually showed out that um, three out of four people watched the first grand final of Australian Idol in Australia. It's unbelievable. That is a, <clears throat> to be a part of a cultural moment like that is extraordinary mm. to have been, you know, and it was a great honor. It, we worked with incredible people. I learned enormous amounts about how terrible I was and how, how better I could get. Um, I got to work with the funniest, smartest man I've ever worked with every day, James Matheson. Um, I was very, very, very lucky, and to be, like I said, to be a part of a, a cornerstone of popular culture like that is an extraordinary honour. Um, I did a gig down in Canberra the other day with the National Gallery, and someone who works at the National Film and Sound Archive there came up to me and said, "I put your Opera House Grand Final from 2003 in the archive in the vault the other day." Wow! Like, Whoa, we're in the vault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's it's deemed as historical of historical significance, I guess. <sighs> Um, and then, you know, like, and now we're coming into our seventh season of The Bachelor. To, to get seven seasons of a show, we did seven on, on Idol. To get seven seasons of a show is incredible. Some people don't get seven episodes, right? Mm. To have done that twice, man, I, I still can't figure out what I'm doing that has allowed me to have this. But I'll work very, very hard, as hard as I can to keep it. Dude, look, honestly, you know, there's enough there to be like, okay, you know, Osh is a dependent variable in that. But, I mean, you just, you're a good dude. Like, it's 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 pretty pretty obvious on my part. There's, I mean, I don't know what's behind closed doors. You could be uh, could be a murderer, in which case we'll, uh, we'll dive into that later. <laughs> but, Not unless yeah. I've done something that I can't remember. Yeah, very true, yeah. No, but you're just a good dude. Like, it's, um, yeah, it seems pretty pretty straight and narrow. I think that's, you know, I, I've been working in the broadcasting now for 25 years and um my kid was asking me this the other day uh, we were watching some show and you know someone was being a prima donna and she goes you know anyone who is like that and i said if they if there are 
they don't they're not around for long. Mm. Very know, true. You're gonna have to be so good at what you do that people will put up with your shit. Mm. But there's maybe two people in Australian broadcasting that get away with it. Mm. Um, because of the amount of money they bring in. Right. Um, everyone else, like, if you're not a good hang, if you're not okay to be around, eventually they'll find someone else to do it because people don't want to go to work with that energy. It's like any workplace. Mm. It's like any workplace. If, you know, if, if Jeff in accounts is just a prick to everybody. He is. Like eventually, eventually it's like, you know, Jeff, um, we've, we've decided to restructure. Yeah. <laughs> Your job's no longer required. Yeah. Like, what was it something I said? <laughs> no, it's just like, you know, the fact that everybody wants to be at a desk as far away from you as possible might have something to do with it, Jeff. So true. Yeah. So, Osh, in terms of, I was watching um, an interview that you were you were talking about your book. So we'll move on to that, um, the book just quickly again. And um, you were saying how important taking care of yourself is. And it's amazing for me I mean, it's not necessarily amazing because it's something that I only found um, with going through the same thing with OCD being probably the biggest contributor to it and, and anxiety. But just how much better your life can be when you you get up every 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 morning when the alarm goes off, you 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 take care of your exercise. You know, you, you sorry, excuse me. You exercise a lot. You eat healthily, and you have a you have a purpose, and you take care of your mind as well. How much of your mental health was bettered I guess by those simple tricks because a lot of people feel like when they're when they're in the shit that it's just them and we all we know the neurology behind it that it's just them and and that they've tried all those things and nothing nothing's going to help them um I would say that you know and I, I can I can say this because I've done it um in the same way that you don't accidentally appear on the front cover of men's health magazine you don't accidentally or just by itself have um great mental health if you've shown that you know you need to put a little extra work in right? mm. it takes it takes work but it's worth it um i'm i was on meds for a long time um many many years and all kinds of meds at one point, apparently all of them. Mm. Um, and I'm currently not on meds, but there's a very big difference between not taking your meds and not needing to take your meds. And to keep not needing to take my meds, there's some things that I need to do every day in the same way that, I don't know, someone who's diabetic um, needs to be aware of everything. I only recently got diagnosed celiac, so I need oh. to be aware of what I'm eating so mm. I don't get cancer of the duodenum, right? Um, you know, it's just something that you need to do. And if you've got a brain that, you know, is a little, uh, you know, has a penchant for wanting to run away with itself every now and again, there's some things that you can do every day that will improve that. Mm. Um, and, you know, those things um, can be, you know, multitudinous, but at the least, you know, if you're not feeling valued, if you're not feeling that you have meaning, if you're not feeling that you matter to somebody, if you're not feeling your work, work has purpose, if you're not feeling safe, um, those things are all going to impact your mental well-being quite extraordinarily. And mm. these, hopefully, unless you're in a war zone, you can do some things about that. Um, you can do some things about how, you know, do you feel valued? Can you find a way to be of value to somebody? Yes. Um, yes. Can you, uh, you know, do you feel you're worthy? Can you find worthiness within yourself? Um, do you feel that your <clears throat> your work has meaning? Um, if you can't find a job that has meaning for you, for example, your friend who does your laundry, her her work has extraordinary meaning. To mm. her. Um, can you, you know, think about the way you think about your work? Like you might, I don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a job that I can't live without. And it's a job that somebody does and it's a job that someone pays their wages with, pays their, you know, puts food in their kid's mouth with. Like say you could be a, a, a cashier at the supermarket, right? Mm. 
and you might just sit there going, boop, I hate my life, boop, I hate my life, boop, I hate my life. Or you could go, look at this, I'm helping every one of these people feed their families. I'm helping this person make healthy choices about their, this might be the first day of their health kick and I'm here to make sure that they have a great time and they're on their way. This is extraordinary. I'm helping these people have worked hard to make this money and with yeah. this money they're turning it into food and that food is going to sustain them through you know being there for their families and making sure their kids have a great day. All right, that's what that job can be if you want it. Mm. But you've got to actively think about it that way. Mm. Um, so there, those are some things, but there's also things that you can do um, internally to make sure that you're going to get the, the best chance. Uh, oh yeah, and if you're not feeling safe, then find a way to feel safe. True. Um, and that might mean thinking about your relationship, thinking about where you live, um, you know, finding maybe ways around that if you can, if you're able to. Um, and there's also things that you can do every day, you know, moving your body has an incredibly positive effect on, on your, on your well being. Um, there's research out there that weighs it up against antidepressants. I would recommend you go and search that out. Um, you know, stimulating the dopamine, serotonin and norepinephrine in your body by working out. I prefer to do so in the morning. Um, it's easier for me to lift heavy and in lifting heavy, I feel better. Mm. So I used to just ride bikes, but then I now lift things. Um, and, you know, being mindful of, of, of your thoughts and like we were talking about before, you know, not necessarily, necessarily questioning every thought, but just being aware of being able to be an observance of the thoughts and just check them, just double check them. And sometimes I go offshore. I go, hey, honey, you know that thing that I said to that person, did they react funny or am I thinking that? She goes, you're thinking that. So like, oh, okay. And that way I kind of know. Sometimes mm. I have a hard time telling. Um, but yeah, I write a gratitude list every day. I, I write down all the things that are swirling around in my brain, whatever I might be fearful of. I write it down every day. I challenge those things hand, you know, with my hand, with a piece of paper and a pen. Um, I challenge those things if I need to. I write down, uh, you know, what I see for myself and, you know, what I like to get done in that day, what I did good in the last 24 hours, what I like to do better in the next 24. You know, all these things I do every day. And sometimes I have to get up quite early to get them done. But um, when I don't do it, I miss it. Mm. Oh, the other thing, the other thing that I think is really, really, really important is prioritizing sleep. Mm. Um, I've done my fair share of field testing on how drugs can make you feel good or bad. And I would like to say that categorically, nothing feels as good as eight hours. It's true. Ooh, eight hours of sleep, man. Oh yeah. That's the one. Yep. That's the one. Eight hours of sleep with a bit so, of toast. Um, Ooh. That's the, that's the one. So prioritizing sleep can go so far to improving how you feel through your day. And look, if that's what you need to do to get by, then that's it. You might yep. then only have 23 other hours that you've got to get your shit done with. But the life you get to live because you are so deliberate and have that discipline just puts multiples of effectiveness and satisfaction mm. on top of what you would have had otherwise. And I can only say that from well, from my experience, that's what's happened. Yeah, it's great. And I think I think it comes down to the ability to recognize that you are an individual that has needs, but could also potentially cultivate dreams as well. You know, we, we live in a world now, um, this is something that Viktor Frankl spoke a lot about, where, you know, the need to to survive all the time has essentially been, you know, the very least in the Western world has been eradicated completely where, you know, I say this all the time, but the, um, the worst thing that we have to deal with is, is poor Wi-Fi, you know, and for our grandparents to, to, to even be able to conceptualize Wi-Fi is just beyond any form of idea that they could think of, you know, but we live in that world and it's all, it's a great world. It's I'm so appreciative to, to be alive in this day and age, you know, but then, there's all this stimulus all the time that's telling us to do this and be more and better and junk values and all, and all sorts of things that when we finally do move away from all that, it's only it's only a few times if you don't prioritize it that you begin to actually recognize again, oh shit, I'm a person and that's right. I, I had a dream that I wanted to be like a fireman when I was younger and you know, creating a vision for yourself and looking forward to tomorrow as opposed to constantly ruminating in your head about all the things that happened and you know shit that you couldn't control is is so important you know it's just having that having a vision yeah i would i would absolutely i would absolutely agree um uh victor frankl actually 
there's many things in that book that he wrote, Man's Search for Meaning, that um, really stood out for me. And mm. I, I think the, the, there's two that are really powerful. Number one is, um, you know, it's how you, the, the, the greatest power we have as humans is how we choose to think about things. Mm. And then, um, having had a brain that got quite sick and I wasn't able to make that choice, being able to do it again is, uh, yeah, it's, it's fabulous. Um, the other thing that he said, which is really good, I think he was quoting his grandmother, um, that there is no such thing as good or bad weather. There, oh no, there is no, there is no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate choice of clothing. <laughs> uh, and I thought that's, you know, that's some deep wisdom, right? There. Yeah. And I've heard it. I've heard it prophesied that there's there's no such thing as bad surf, only inappropriate choice of surf craft. Oh, very good. Yes. Also a very, very good one. That'll be the, the that'll be the takeaway. The surf. the surf is the surf. The surf the waves are doing what the waves are doing. All right. What you choose to go out in them, or if you choose to go out in them, that's what makes it good or bad. Mm. Like, you could, you know, if it's not just like a perfectly peeling left hand sand bottom bank with nobody on it, yeah. Or it could be a junky onshore, you know, crumbly swell. But if you've got a surf net, you're gonna have the best day ever. So yeah, true. It's all about. It was Dave Rastovich who told me that. It was a very pleasant man. Reminds me of a uh, of a a Buddhist story where there's like an old farmer and and he you know he's working there and um, one night his his horse runs away and a couple of people come up to him and they say oh you know you must be te- terribly depressed you know your horse ran away and he says oh good bad who knows then the next day the horse runs um, back to the farm with twenty other horses. And they're like, oh my God, the, the horse brought back all these friends. Now you have all this, all these horses to work with. You know, it, it's amazing luck. And he said, oh, good, bad, who knows? And then the next day, his son jumps on one of the horses. And when he's riding, he, he breaks his leg, falls off the horse. And the, uh, the people come up to him again, all the, all the worried other farmers. And they say, I can't believe it. You, you know, you're that, all those horses, one of them, you, 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 you know, your son jumped on and he, and he broke his leg. You, you, I mean, that's terrible. And he said, oh, Good, bad, who knows? The next day, the uh, you know that the 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 army um, people come along that want to conscript the son, and um, they choose not to because he has a broken leg. And it's just a really great idea that you never know how things are going to play out when they play out. And the better we can get at just finding the stillness within ourselves, the easier it's, we're going to live a better life. You know, we really are. I would, I would agree with you, Tom. I would agree with you, but that stillness does take work to get to. Does. Um, yeah, I was, I have a, some guy, that, there's a guy I'm working with that's helping me with my meditation at the moment um, because every player needs a coach. Mm. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I struggle with that too. Yeah, it took me about six years to get to, you know, like, far out, okay. All right, We're it's going to take six years. It's going to take six years. Uh, that's what I'm going to need to do. I'm going to have to get going, I'm afraid, I'm afraid Tom. Dude. Is, there, is there anything else you needed to cover off? Just wanted to say, um, where can people find you and um, any way we can uh, get to your book and all that sort of stuff? Give us the rundown. Oh, look. Oh, it's super easy, man. It's all at the website, osherginsberg.com. Perfect. That's Put it. it. That's where you'll find the Instagram, the Twitter, the buy the book, listen to the podcast, listen to yes. the songs that I make my coffee to. Um, it's all there. Awesome. I'll put it up. I'll make sure it's in the links. I I make coffee in the morning. I play a song when I make my coffee. Um, There's a playlist that's emerged out of that. I I think it's okay. Oh, nice. What's um, what's your go-to coffee? Black coffee? Oh, yeah, man. Double espresso. Good, good. I'm not here to fuck fuck No, that's right. I was, but uh, now it's awkward because we ended up doing a podcast. (laughs) (laughs) All right, buddy. Cool. Thanks so much, dude. Gonna talk to you. Um, au revoir. Take yes. Care, man. Let me know how you go. All right. Yeah, we'll do, man. All right. Bye.